I pressed the wrong button and then it went off and now it's gone on again and I think I'm live so I'm going to get off the phone. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye, everyone. Oh, my goodness. I've already done one tasting just now. It's been very exciting. I've just come off my Yarra Valley Chardonnay tasting onto a Muraduck Estate Pinot Noir tasting. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Michael. Lovely to see you. It is a very exciting wine. Um, hello, Rob. Yes, it's soggy here at Muraduck as well. Um, the dogs and Jill and Richard went for a walk while I was talking about Yarra Valley Chardonnay um, on Instagram. And uh, so I managed to avoid going out in the rain, but Polly's looking a distinct cafe latte colour at the moment. Oh, she's disappeared. She's watching out the window. Oh, there we go. There's Frodo. There's Polly in the background, um, both looking wet and soggy. Anyway, hello, Cutty and John. Lovely to see you. Michael and Rod, lovely to see you. Nick and Jennifer, lovely to see you. Kay, great to see you. I'm glad you enjoyed the punch session, Kay. And thank you for sending me your picture of food it looks delicious and I'm feeling hungry now um Craig hi Michael hello Emily and Kevin lovely to see you and a delight to see you as well I keep missing you when I do my deliveries but at least we get to see each other online virtually um Jill hi I hope you've got some delicious food organized I haven't seen a photo of it hi Jill see Jill's been out in the rain <laughs> uh Renee and Matt lovely to see you it has had quite the rap hasn't it um, yes, Jeremy, you're right. We are very soggy here. Alison and Andrew, lovely to see you. David, Barry, uh, Alison, yes. Paul and Melissa here in Primed. I think we better get this bottle of wine open, don't you? Angela and Simon. Oh, Chicken Kiev. How oh, happy birthday, Simon. Yay. I think Chicken Kiev, Angela, will go very nicely with Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is the most versatile grape variety in the world. And I think chicken is the most versatile protein in the world. And so you bring them both together and they do beautiful things together. Michael and Nikki Cross, Vegemite sandwiches sounds delicious. And I think, you know, you don't need to go fancy, do you? Sarah, hello, lovely to see you. Hello to all the tricks. <laughs> now, oh, I'm getting so excited about this that I wasn't even gonna show you the label. So tonight, drum roll please. We, I wonder if Jeff's there. Jeff, are you there? Jeff Plan? No, no, mushroom, bacon and cheese tart, yum. Daryl and Sue, hi, hi, how are you? Ah, oh, Cutty, that sounds delicious, lots of mushrooms. As long as you like mushrooms, I've got a friend who can't eat mushrooms. I don't understand, but, you know, it's just her thing. Anyway, Muraduck Estate, the Muraduck, McIntyre, Pinot Noir, 2018. Now, it's really funny about this wine because this wine, you'll recognise the label with our little duck on the on the front. We call it the duck for short, spelt D-U-C, just because that's how we spell Muraduck. Um, and this little wine in previous years has done very well in various tastings. Uh, and, um, oh, duck party pies, Kate. Mm, you'll have to tell me your sauce. I think duck party pies sound amazing with this wine. Great levels of deliciousness and wickedness. Um, ah, okay, Claire. Porcini Aranchi sauté. Oh, yum. Kate Bartlett, Kate, Adrian, and Sarah. Hi. Veggie bruschetta, roasted mushrooms, cheddar, and yum. Oh, Rob, weather nerd warning. Thank you. <laughs> Had 730 millimetres so far for this year, and the Bureau Seasonal Outlook says wet days ahead. Uh, well, they did say that we were moving into a La Nina system, which means more rain, less sunshine. Um, so I guess we can't be too surprised. Uh, oh, good, Nikki. I'm glad to hear that Michael was fibbing about his Vegemite sandwiches. Although, you know, Vegemite and good bread and butter can work quite well with Pinot Noir. But much better to waste it, better, much better to spend a week's wages at Tully's and make sure that you've got lots of delicious things to nibble on. Mushroom pizza, buffer, yum, good on your shell. You guys always do very well. Balsamic glazed duck breast, oh my god, I'm opening the bottle now. Let's get some Pinot in our glasses. So, as I said to you in the email today, I always recommend, particularly with this wine, don't open the bottle early. It doesn't need to be opened early, it doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be decanted. In fact, you lose some of the intrigue and the deliciousness of the aromas and flavours of the wine if you open it too early. Um, so I have my Pinot glass. 
you really need a Pinot glass, a nice big bowl-shaped glass for this wine. I started saying something earlier about this label and about this wine and the fact that it, it's, of all of our wines, it's the only wine that has been on the cover of Decanter, not only once but twice, which is very exciting. Um, oh, one of the, oh, Kate, thank you. That's awesome, Pran Market. I don't think I can legally get there yet, but when I can, I'll be, I'll be there. I will be there. I've got text coming through. Oh, yes, pictures nicely. Thank you. Um, I'll look at those later. I'm a little distractible today. Um, so the 2013 version of this wine and the 2017 version of this wine both at different times got on the front cover of Decanter Magazine, which is an English wine magazine, probably one of the most highly regarded wine magazines in the world. Um, so for that reason, this is a this is a um, a cover model. People recognise that label now. Wine nerds like me um, recognise that label, and they we get. You can almost always tell the people who have never tasted our wine but just want to buy the best because they'll ring up and say, ah, oh, I, I, I have had a look at your website. I'd like to buy some of the 2017 Duck Pinot. I was like, well, we were selling that last year. It's all sold. The 2018 actually is even better, I think, than the 17 was. But, you know, if you buy the wines regularly when they're released, then you can make your own decision about which is the best of, of the ducks. Rest assured, we will never make a duck pinot if we don't think it's good enough to be called duck pinot. So it will always be of a certain quality. And we'll talk about why and how and all that kind of th thing in a minute. But let's, um, let me just, wasabi peas. Penny, I think wasabi peas on their own would be delicious for a snack. Not so great with this pinot noir. But I know for a fact that I haven't sent you your tasting pack yet, so you so you may have something else uh, open, which might go very well with your wasabi peas. Um, Amanda, those wontons, duck spring, onion, hosin sauce and chilli sound delicious. Um, Paul and Sam, do you know Simon or are we just friends now on, um, on, on, on virtual tastings on Thursday nights? And I'm glad you're enjoying it. I think it's a wine that opens up really dramatically and then it changes and evolves in the glass all through the drinking. So... My first point about this wine is that it is going to... Oh, Karen, good to hear you eating the cheese because I think the right cheese with this wine is also delicious. Um, we'll all sing happy birthday to Simon at the end, huh? <laughs> Duck terrine, yum. Uh, what was I saying? I get myself all carried away with talking to you guys and forget what I'm saying and someone's texting me again. Oh, Shell, you got pizza. Good work. Good work. Sounds delicious. I do like a good artisanal pizza, and if someone else makes it, even better, I say. So, Duck Pinot Noir. Let's taste it first, and then I'll talk to you about it. It's a wine for me that has the most beautiful perfume. There's lots and lots. I know Reggie wants to come in. Okay, let me tell you a story about Reggie today. I, for those of you who are not in the middle of the Muradak Turong storm, it has been raining there are gale force winds it is gray and cold and miserable out there and the poor peacock has been sitting in the most sheltered part of the winery all day and Richard made him come into the courtyard because he sleeps up on that wall I know you see him jump up there as it gets dark it's so windy the poor bird is just going I don't want to go up on my wall tonight it's horrible up there so he's just standing there can I please come in the dogs would give him a very hard time if he was allowed in, but he'll be okay. He'll find somewhere nice to shelter and uh, and have a good sleep. But peacocks, they come from India. They don't like this weather. This is not their natural environment. He's really struggling. He really struggles with this kind of weather. Pork and ginger dumplings. Yum, Francesca. That sounds delicious. So I always say with this wine, give it a good swirl. Get some air into it once you've had a smell because it will keep changing quite quickly um, early on and you'll get a little bit of um, lifted rose petal violet perfume. Then you'll get the next sip, you'll get that beautiful dark black cherry fruit. It's really intense. It's really luscious. There's some chocolate notes, dark chocolate cocoa notes. There's some spice characters that are starting to come through and we'll explore that a little bit more as they open up a bit more. 
it's just it's densely packed with flavor and aroma I haven't even put it in my mouth yet let me have a little sip I hope you've all had a sip The thing I love about this wine is that it has incredible structure. It has that dark fruit. It has that beautiful tangy acidity that just makes your mouth water. And it's why I think having all that delicious food on your table is going to bring you much joy tonight with this wine because the, the acidity of the wine will just really um, get all your, uh, get all your um, salivary glands going and should be really delicious. And I think there are some definite black forest cake aromatics there, but it's all savoury. So um, I've told some of you this story before, I'm sure. Now, I have this enduring memory of the restaurant that no longer exists. It was called The Latin in the city in the 1990s and I think the noughties. Um, Bill Marchetti was the chef. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys uh, ate there, but I worked for an Italian wine importer then. and um, he hello Sarah how lovely to see you um it has been a long while the garden pinot is delicious too um really delicious so the latin Bill Marchetti used to make this incredible dish and it was um duck breast that he would pan sear and then he would make a sauce with cherries that he had aged in grappa for two years so he would buy he would buy the cherries the week between Christmas and New Year when they were at their very best and he would de-stalk them but leave the pips in them and pack the jars with them, make sure that they were all perfect and then he'd cover them with grappa and he'd close them up for two years. And, the, and it was very important that they had that much time in the grappa because what would happen over that time was that the grappa would seep its way into the cherries and not only would the cherry flesh become soaked in grappa, the pits of the cherries would start to disintegrate a little bit and bring a little bit of bitterness into the flavor of the cherry so then he made this incredible sauce that went on top of the duck breast with these incredible cherries um, the cherries and with the duck juices after he'd cooked it probably lots and lots of butter and salt and pepper and all, all the evil things in the world. It was the most incredible flavoured dish and it always this wine always makes me think of that dish because it's got the it's got that meaty, um, sweet duck kind of aromatic flavour to it, but it's got that lovely sweet cherry, it's got that little bit of bitterness, it's got that grip, all sorts of great things. Yeah, Karen. See, I'm glad some of you remember the Latin. It was a great restaurant. I think I think Bill Marchetti's living in Hong Kong these days. His brother's in Sydney, but anyway. Um, between Christmas and New Year's, Rob and Deb, um, absolutely. Cherries into a jar, grapper on top, leave it two years. You will not regret it. Uh, you will have to eat some of them fresh, though, because cherries are awesome fresh too. It's my favourite. It's my favourite fruit. My favourite time of the year is cherry season. Probably why I like Pinot Noir so much. Ah. So why is this Pinot Noir so jolly delicious? Well, I th absolutely the Paris end of Collins Street, Isaac. And this one as well reminds me, it's, it's definitely Pinot Noir, but it's at the more structured um, tannic end of Pinot Noir, which is why I love it as well, because it's got all those beautiful aromatics and they're just kept in check, not just by the acid, but by that beautiful velvety firm tannin. There's lots and lots of tannin in there, but it's really velvety. It's really, it's really textural and, um, and it's really delicious. This wine will drink beautifully as you're noticing right now. It's a lovely wine to drink young, but if you put it in your cellar for 10, 15 years, it will, you'll reap the rewards of patience and it will age very, very well. I think it's got that fabulous balance. It's got that fabulous intensity, incredible complexity that it will age slowly and well. And I, I really do think this is probably um, so far the best duck pinot that we've made. The 17 was lovely. I think this is better. It's a little bit younger at the moment, but uh, I haven't had a chance to show this to the judges at Decanter yet, but, you know, that would be interesting. There is a little lavender aromatic flavour to this wine. Penny, if you don't have a cellar, 
then it's probably unless you've got a one of those expensive wine fridges that keeps everything temperature controlled then you just want to drink it a bit younger than you would if you put it in a cellar because um, the best way to age wine is in a cellar and the reason for that is that the it's in the dark so no light um, constant cool temperature so ideally around um, around uh, sorry I just read Nick's comment you'll be 90 then you'll still be wanting to drink good wine when you're 90 don't you play games with me you and Jill and Richard will be playing bridge and guzzling Pinot Noir and loving it so um, yeah yeah uh, <laughs> But you don't need to save it for that long. The other thing that you can do, and the other way that you can test this wine, I think we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, if you're not sure whether it's a wine that's going to age well, then if you can bear to put half of that bottle aside and come back to it tomorrow, so it's had um, 24 hours of air, that will show you a little bit how that wine's going to age. It's not a perfect representation of how it's going to age. It will be better if you give it the time to age, but it will give you it will give you an idea of how the flavours will develop and how the wine will age. Um, alternately, just buy it, drink it young, enjoy it for its vibrancy and deliciousness. Drink the bottle slowly and it will change and evolve and it will bring you huge pleasure right now. So no need to age the wine. Um, <laughs> Michael, thank you. That's very nice. I also got tingles up my spine when uh, when our wine starred and also when Aussie wine starred because there is this kind of this this little kind of snobbery amongst certain British wine critics that Australian wine Australian wine quite good, but it's not nearly as good as other um, wines from other parts of the world. So when we manage to surprise people that it's um, even better than they expected, then that's really lovely. It's always nice to take people by surprise. Um, I'm not going to even engage in all of you guys talking about being old because that's ridiculous, ridiculous. Um, but I've forgotten what I was going to say now. I've lost track of my thoughts again. Um, so <laughs> oh, dear. Um, do that thing that I told you about when you keep your mouth open when you're smelling it and you'll get those aromas sort of doing a little bit of it's it's like when you if anyone here has tried to learn to play a didgeridoo and you try and do circular breathing it's a bit like that it's circular smelling circular breathing okay that sounds so delicious yum um oh craig that's very kind well you know we do try and keep our wine very good value for money um and and this wine <coughs> This one more and more. Hello, Jeff. Glad to see you're here. Is Reggie still out there? He's given up. He's gone to try and find some shelter somewhere. Um, I agree with you, Craig. Um, the reason that a French, that the best Burgundy is costing more and more and more these is that it's more famous um, than our wine and there's more demand for it around the world than there is for this wine. But that said, this wine is getting harder and harder for us to allocate to the people who want to buy it. So it's one of the reasons that we started our wine club. Um, is there anyone else out there not in Melbourne? Ben, there are other people in the, the – um, the, Craig, Craig, you're in New South Wales, aren't you? Um, ben, we, we accept people from anywhere. We have um, someone from Bahrain as well joining in. I haven't seen him today. I haven't seen him for a little while. Uh, we have a few. Uh, we have a few people who join us from um, Queensland often. So uh, yes, very nice to very nice to see um, to see people not from Melbourne or the Mornington Peninsula, but also nice to see you Melbournians and Mornington Peninsula people. So Ben, we're all feeling a little bit locked down at the moment, so we get a little bit overexcited with our um, online tastings, but we love having people from everywhere, which is awesome. So cheers. Um, as this wine opens, I'm just sort of trying to take a moment to really engage with the wine because uh, I do think it deserves some pause and some thought. And it's just starting to be more perfumed again and we're seeing 
that lavender that Sam mentioned um, coming through and was it Sam that me someone mentioned lavender? Um, I think, no, I think it was Michelle. Um, anyway, that lavender, some herbal notes. There's some, there's these lovely perfumes of, um, of wild thyme and rosemary, a little tiny mm. bit of wild mint that goes very nicely with those chocolatey notes. Um, it's, and, the, and this is a really quintessential, I think, not just Pinot Noir, but it's a really quintessential cool climate Australian Pinot Noir. And that little wild mint character, cinnamon, absolutely. Michael and Rod, a um, little bit of cinnamon spice. There's some lifted um, almost star anise coming through now. So a little bit of Asian spice, a little bit of Moroccan spice. Yeah, we talked about Moroccan spice uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, I think, before we tasted lots of Chardonnay last week. Um, I know, poor Reggie. He's very unhappy today. Maybe when I take Polly home, Richard and Jill will let him in. Oh, no, Frodo likes to chase him as well. There's no hope for the poor bird. It's, uh, he's, he's survived through other storms. He'll be okay. He'll be okay. He's tough. But this wine, why is this wine so good? Well, first of all, we make this wine in exactly the same way as we make our estate Pinot Noir, that as we make our Robinson Pinot Noir and... No, just those three because the Garden Vineyard Pinot is made differently. That's a whole bunch of wine um, that somebody's drinking tonight. Um, but so the winemaking is exactly the same for all of the Pinots except for the Garden Vineyard. So it's not about us manipulating the fruit in the winery to make it taste better. It's all about or taste different because I actually, I think this wine is our most famous wine. Um, I think it's big and it's ripe and it's it's rich. Um Yes, Barry, I will, absolutely. Um, uh, it is the same one making as Devil Bend Creek um, Pinot, except that it sees 20% new oak. So wine making very, very quickly, very simply. The fruit is hand-picked. It's de-stemmed, so there are no stalks in the ferment. It goes through the de-stemmer and the whole berries go into uh, fermenters. We have one and two tonne stainless steel fermenters. Um, and we make all of the different, so we pick and make all of the different clones from all of the different vineyard sites separately. So this wine is all from the McIntyre Vineyard, which is our family vineyard, but we have a number of different parcels planted here. And, and so we've got the old, cab, the old Cabernet vines we had. We've actually, have I told you this already? We actually um, made the very difficult decision this winter to pull the old Cabernet vines out um, and we're going to replant sometime down the track. But they just, in the last few years, they, um, they, they, uh, they, just, they just weren't doing what they needed to do anymore. So, But this wine has fruit from those vines, which were Cabernet vines that got grafted over to a number of different clones of Pinot Noir um, over a period of about three or four years, about 10 years ago. 10 to 14 years ago. We also have a number of different plots of different clones of Pinot Noir down um, in the newer vineyard, and those vines are now nearly 30 years old. So, um, so uh, different clones are vinified separately and different parcels are vinified separately. We keep them all separate until, um, until we make our final decisions about what goes where. Let me just make sure that I'm not missing any questions because they're coming fast and furious. So, Cutty, the vine age um, between, uh, so the earliest vines, those Cabernet vines were planted in 1983 and the younger Pinot vines were planted in 1991, 94. I got Richard whispering in my ear from the other side of the room. Uh Yes, Jeremy, I will answer that question in just a moment. Thank you for it. It's a very good one. Um, once the berries are in the fermenter, we cover the fruit with um, carbon dioxide and we cover it up with a big plastic wrap and rubber band to keep all the air out. Um, okay, Penny, I'll answer that in a sec too. Uh, 
we don't add anything at this point. So we don't add any yeast and the natural yeast that come in from the vineyard that live in our winery start the ferment sometime in the following sort of five to eight days. Um, once the ferment starts, we plunge the wine twice. We pump it over, plunge the wine twice a day just to mix the skins back into the juice to get as much tannin and colour and flavour extraction from the skins as we can because we like that character in the structure of the wine and um and uh then we have a post fermentation maceration which means after the ferment's finished we seal it all up again and we leave it for maybe another week so the wine spends about 20 days on skins altogether um we then press it off it goes to barrel um and it's a dry wine by then but it spends about 14 months in barrel all up and the first six months or so of time in the barrel, it's unsulfured and it goes through a natural, um, a natural uh, malolactic fermentation during that time. Um, so very simple, pretty natural winemaking. Um, the other nice thing about having that 14 months in the barrel is that the um, wine is then able to have the time to full clear. We look at it before we bottle it, but... Um, I'm just trying to think if I'm telling a lie here. In the last 10 years, since we've been making this wine like this, um, it, it, we bottle it unfiltered and unfined because it falls clear naturally and filtration doesn't, uh, sorry, fining doesn't do anything to improve the flavours. We do a fining trial. We always find that it's found its natural balance and its natural tannin structure and all of those things without us having to do any polishing at the end. Um we then keep it in bottle for a couple of years before we release it and then that's it. So that's the wine making for all of our Pinots except for the Garden Vineyard, which is fermented on a whole bunch. Um, the Estate and the Robinson and the McIntyre all see about 20% new oak and the rest of the oak is uh, one to 10 years old and doesn't give that oak flavour. Um, yes, Reg the Maroodock Peacock is joining us. He's, he's right there. And, yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, 14 to 16 degrees centigrade is perfect temperature-wise. Room temperature. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't chill this wine at all. Uh, you'll lose a lot of the perfume. Um, you also don't want it warm, though, Penny. So if you're in the tropics, then maybe a little, a little dunk in the ice before you drink it. Um, Jeremy's question uh, about the wine changes due to the season each year, but the common character that we see in the dark is and 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 this character as i was sort of alluding to before comes from the site i believe and it's a combination of the site and the combination of the um clonal selection that we have here and the age of the vines i think are all very important things that bring to bear the character of this wine and for me the mcintyre the duck always has a darker fruit profile than any of our other Pinots. It's more black cherry, um, less red cherry. It has a lovely spicy character to it. It has those herbal notes as well that are all part of the complexity. It has a complexity to it and, a, and, and layers and layers of, um, of, uh, of, of flavour that, as I say, evolves slowly with the, with the glass um, in time. And uh, the other thing that I find unique and um, that we see in the duck year in, year out is that beautiful velvety texture, those very firm tannins and that very firm structure to the wine that are not chunky at all. There's a finesse and an elegance to the wine, but it doesn't have the purity and line of the Robinson. Um, it's just, it's, it, it, it's a bit bigger and um, more complex and more things sort of working to show themselves over time. So it is a very complex wine and it is a very special wine and I think that that savouriness and richness kind of comes together with an elegance. So it's kind of a bit of a, bit of a dichotomy. It's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing. Um, uh, oh, gosh, questions. Um, Anne, yes, we would love to do a parallel tasting between the Duck Robinson and Estate Pinots. Um, we did actually do an online um, tasting with the uh, Robinson and the McIntyre Pinot uh, when we released them in June. 
um, that we promoted to the wine club, but I think it's probably a good opportunity for us to revisit that tasting and look at maybe a couple of back vintages as well, um, whether we do that online or whether we do it uh, do it in person, I guess, depends on how quickly we manage to open up this state and get together again. But, yes, I think that would be very cool um, and we will, we will definitely endeavour to do that again soon. Um, yeah, Penny, I'm sorry, I, I actually misunderstood your question about temperature. You're talking about um, how best to age the wine. So, yes, cool, a cooler temperature is better than um, a warmer temperature, um, somewhere between 10 and 16 degrees. But if you've got a war, if you've got around 16 degrees all year round, that's better than it being 5 degrees in winter and 16 degrees in summer. Um, Reggie's gone up on his, see, he's all right. He's gone up on his wall. He's good. See? Good on you, Renee. <laughs> um, there is almost a Morello cherry character in there and a spicy, spicy character which brings out the spice in, in duck curries, for example. <laughs> Paul, I think that's a great, I think that's a great note. And and this line is so robust that it works well with slightly spicy food. It works really well with a great um, with a with a really good piece of steak. Um, it works really well with uh, with lots of other things. Um, so Reggie's ego is a bit out of hand, Jeff. You are correct. Um, <laughs> uh, um, the punch Pinot Noir would be a very interesting tasting to do too. I think that um, as we progress with our Thursday night drinks and I have to invite more guests in, it would be nice to have James Lance um, come and show off his Pinot too. I think that would be uh, delicious. Um, Kay, we are going to talk now very quickly about wine reviews. I know I keep getting um, I keep getting distracted, don't I? Now I did. I sent you um, this this afternoon the um, Halliday review for this wine. So, and the thing about the Halliday book that I find um, interesting at the moment is that once upon a time, James actually tasted all of the wines that were reviewed in that book, and he reviewed them all and. He gave them all points. Now, one thing that you need to know about the Halliday book is that those wines are not tasted blind. So, And he now has five or six people who help him taste the wine. They're all very good palates. I have absolutely no problem with any of them tasting my wine, but the problem is that getting them all to score wines on the same level scoring ground is quite difficult. So for a lot of people talk about wine reviews and they don't bother to read the words, they just look at the numbers. And number scores, I think, are they're, they're an easy way to rank wines. But but unless you've tasted all those wines next to each other, how can you possibly say that a wine that you tasted last week and gave 96 or 97 or 100 points? And I don't think the Halliday book ever gives 100 points. They've given 99, but I think that Halliday has a, um, has a philosophy that there's no such thing as a perfect wine. I know that Robert Parker gives 100-point wines, and if you get 100 points for Robert Parker, you don't have to work to sell your wine ever again. Um, we will never get 100 points from Robert Parker because we don't make the sort of wine that he likes. His palate is very much um, very, very much about big, rich, heavy wines, big Shirazes. Um, he likes good Bordeaux, that sort of, that sort of thing. So, Barry, I... I it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that the most important thing when you're reading wine reviewers' reviews is to know the reviewer and to know how your palate and your preferences meld with theirs. Because if I know, and, and our wines in this year's Halliday Companion were tasted by um, Ned Goodwin, who is a fellow master of wine. He and I studied together. I know Ned's palate very well and he and I like some of the same wines and we differ on other wine styles. Um, and he um, he wrote very nice words about most of our wines. He didn't like Usher as, didn't get it at all. Um, and I think he made up his, from what he wrote, I think he probably made up his mind um, maybe before he tasted the wine because there are a lot of people who say, why do people bother making Shiraz in the Mornington Peninsula? But that's okay. I totally understand that that wine is not for everyone. We only make 130 cases. Um, 
but it is subjective. And this one got 95 out of 100, which is a pretty good score. That's a gold medal in a show. But a lot of people go, oh, 95, that's not worth buying because it's not 96 or 97 or 98. And, uh, and um, I think the most important thing are the words. And if you read the words that Ned wrote, and uh, now you're going to ask me what they are, and I'm looking at my computer, which also has the, the, the um, review on it, so I can't actually read it to you at the moment. But go back to my email and read the words that he wrote. And I think he gets this one pretty spot on with his words. It's about the dark fruit. It's about the spice. It's about the layers of flavour. It's about the structure. It's about all of those characters that I love about this wine. Um, and I think, and I agree with you, Barry and Kay, completely, that um, once you work out which reviewers you follow, um, who whose taste you like, um, it's great. And I think the holiday book is going to be more consistent from next year because they've actually, with all the, the different reviewers, Halliday's stepping back from running the book. Tyson Stells is going to be, um, I don't know, in charge of everything. Uh, and um, Jane Faulkner is going to be reviewing Mornington Peninsula every year from now on. So uh, you then only have to work out if you agree with Jane Faulkner's taste in wine and then you'll be able to decide whether or not you want to buy a wine if she gives it a good mark or not. Um, <laughs> Barry, you're confusing me with all the numbers. I like words. I'm not a big fan of numbers personally. Um, but this wine um, and different reviewers, a 96 from one reviewer could be the same as a 94 from another reviewer and a 96 from another reviewer could be like a 98 from someone else who's a little bit more generous so I just say listen a lot go and taste wines a lot as Kay says um, if you like some Mornington Peninsula wines that you taste ask the person who made it what else they recommend I agree absolutely Emily going to cellar doors talking to people who you trust and that's what that's what, you know, we taste each other's wines as well and good winemakers taste a lot of wines other than their own and they can pass you on to things like that. I agree. Oh, look, see, I knew this would, I knew this would start a very a very complicated um, conversation. Alison, thank you. I love our Shiraz as well. But I, 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 do, I do concur that it's not for everyone. Um, Barry and um, Michael and Nikki and everyone, I just think I agree wine scoring is ridiculous. Um, I did a lot of wine show judging earlier in my career and I did enough of it to find out, to discover that I really don't like it and um, it, it doesn't really work for me as a way of judging a wine, whether it's a delicious wine to drink or not because, again, you're tasting lots of wines very quickly and you're kind of saying these are the worst, these are the best, those ones in the middle we don't really care about and I just don't think that's fair. You know, people spend a lot of time and energy in growing grapes and making wine. Most producers are trying to make the best wine that they can um, at a price point that they think they can sell it. And I think doing a tasting like this where we sit down and talk for half an hour, a little bit longer, over a glass or two of one wine, and we taste it as it evolves, we taste it with food, and you guys go away and finish drinking the bottle afterwards, you get so much more insight into this wine than you would from going to a tasting and tasting six different wines in half an hour. Um, so, yes, I know, Stephen Spru, a lot of people would be offended, um, Michael, by my words about it, and I think that there are other people who are much better at tasting wine fast and making value decisions on wine fast. But I think I prefer to, uh, the dogs are going silly now. They've told me that they're telling me that we've had enough talking and enough chatting. So that, that sounds delicious. Jill and Richard are supposed to be keeping the dogs under control, but they're not doing a very good job. <laughs> Michael and Rod, you'll have to have another bottle then. That's easy. But I do think drinking a drinking a beautiful wine slowly over time is absolutely the way to go. So thank you so much, everyone. And it's only my opinion. So, you know, don't take what I say as 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 your only piece of uh, of wine information either, you know. I think reading widely and reading what people say. And I think and I've got to say, Michael, Stevens Brewer is a very good taster and a very impressive um, uh, judger of wines. But we don't always agree on everything either. So, you know, 
And the more you learn for yourself and the more you taste for yourself, the more you can decide who you agree with, who you don't agree with, and that makes it much more interesting because wine's a conversation. It's not about good, bad, and nothing in between. It's about complexity and awesomeness. So on that note, and before the dogs start carrying on like pork chops again, I'm going to, oh, my God, the weather's getting worse. I'm going to say cheers and snuggle up in front of the fire with this lovely glass of wine. Thank you very much, everyone. Next week we have a guest wine. We have Willow Creek Chardonnay next week. And um, if we're allowed to, I don't think we'll be allowed to, um, but if we are, I'll invite Geraldine McFall to come in and talk to us. Otherwise I'll get her on the live chat and she can type away like Barney did last time. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a delight to chat to you again. I will see you all next week. Stay safe. Stay dry on this wet day if you're in our part of the world. And if, if it's like, what's the weather like in Sydney? I didn't even ask. I hope it's delicious and sunny and gorgeous. Anyway, um, keep smelling, keep tasting. Thank you, Michael. I think this one's going to keep changing and uh, I think it will bring you much pleasure for as long as you have some in your glass. Thanks, everyone. See you later. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh.